Welcome back to this exciting tutorial series. This is part seven of how to create a science fiction landscape using nothing but procedural geometry and shaders. Let's get started. What I want to do is set my, my view up to so the size of my frame so it's more cinematic. Now right now it's set up to 16 by nine, which is the ratio so it's, it looks like this, so it's 16 by nine. If you don't know familiar with this, that's what it looks like. You've probably seen that before. And this is of course the, you know, the way you would write a ratio. So what this is saying is um, it's the ratio if you take 16 and you divide that by nine, okay? Do you love my handwriting? It's, it's great, isn't it? You write with a mouse. Okay, um, so I'll delete that. So 16 by nine. Um, now if you divide, I'll get my calculator out. Show you. So if we divide 16 by 9, we get 1.77 repeating. So that's the result of that ratio. Now, 1920 by 1080 is the current resolution of our frame. So 1920 pixels as the width and 1080 pixels is the height. This is the resolution of HD. So a normal flat screen HD television is this resolution. So if you were to render out like this and put it on a TV like that, it would look really great. If you did higher resolution than this, so you know you bumped it up to you know 2K or something, and you put it on a normal television, it's not going to look any better. It's going to look exactly the same. So this is the maximum resolution of an HD TV. Some computer monitors and laptop monitors, this is their maximum resolution. So if you render any bigger than this, uh, it's not going to be noticeable. It's only when you get to higher resolution screens like 4K monitors or 2K monitors that you start to see the difference. It's not the biggest difference in the world, but um, you know, you start to really notice it as you get up to 4K. Now, a cinema screen, you know, isn't shaped like this. It's, it's much wider, okay? So the ratio, there's a lot of different ratios for different um, formats for cinema. Um, but one of my favorites is, is the ratio, well, it's referred to as 235, which isn't actually the ratio. So it's a uh, 2.35, and that's actually the, res <laughs> I think it's, that five. Uh, it's actually the result of the ratio. Um, don't ask me what the ratio is. I don't know what it is. So let's uh, let's do the math to get this uh, to be the right aspect ratio. Now, one thing you could do is you could keep the 1920, 1080 and just crop in. So just make the height less. So 1080 would drop down to a lower number to get you the right aspect ratio. And that way you're gonna be rendering, you know, just enough pixels to fit on an HDTV or monitor um, and look good. And it's just gonna be cropped in then that's fine. But um, I'm actually gonna go a little bit bigger than HD because one of the results you can get is if you render an image larger than you need it, um, even just a little bit larger, you can scale that image down in your composite for your final export. And what it can do is it can just improve the overall look of the image. You're getting more samples. So we're hitting the scene with more samples because the frame is bigger, but you're also, um, you're, you're resolving the image more. So, you know, like little pores in the rocks are all a little bit bigger. And so you're just getting more detail in them. And then when you shrink it down, that detail is just compressed and it can just make the image look a little sharper, make things look a little bit nicer. So it's a good little trick. All right, so uh, let's, um, let's, let's figure this out. So we want to have the, uh, we want to keep the, um, what do we want to keep? We want to keep the height of 1080 but we want the width of 1920 to be a little bit larger. So uh, as you know, the, the ratio would normally work. Um, so the, the width value, so let's call it X, divided by 1080. All right, that's great. I love writing with a mouse. Um, and that's gonna equal uh, the, the correct ratio, which is 2.35. You're not gonna see it because we've got the camera set up. So there we go. How cool is Grease Pencil, by the way? Look at that, writing in 3D space. We should do another tutorial on how to do amazing animation with Grease Pencil. All right, so two, three, five, you figure it out. Um, now, all right, so, so let's just do that math. So if we're dividing here, so basically what that means is we need to then uh, change this equation so that it's X equals, uh, did, 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 how does this work again? I forget how to set up, but basically it's, it's 1080 times 2.35. Okay, so this very long-winded, boring explanation of frame size is over. So let's go ahead and get our frame ready. <laughs> Sorry about that. I'm sure if you knew that, you wouldn't have gotten involved. Sorry. 1080 times 2.35. So 2, 5, 
three eight. And that's what we're gonna make our width. Two, five, three, eight. There we go. Yep, perfect. Jump back in the camera. And now we've got a cinema screen. Plus we've got really cool blue text floating in the middle of our science fiction environment. That was a freebie. Yeah, Grease Pistol is very cool. You should figure out how to, you can get it down here, annotations. So you just open up that side bit, flip that down, new Grease Pencil, and they're all saved here. It's, it's cool. We're not gonna go into it now, but I recommend checking it out. Awesome, so now we've got our amazing cinematic frame for our awesome science fiction scene. Looks good. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna dive into is the material for our egg object. And like I said, we're gonna be working on creating interesting reflections in it and use that as an excuse to talk about reflections. So buckle up, I hope you're excited about learning about um, reflections. With our egg, let's, um, let's go ahead and we'll select it and um, just make sure, I've already got a material here, a labeled egg material. We did that in a previous one, but if you haven't done that yet, go ahead and just create a new material and call it egg material. And uh, we're gonna just make our view a little bit bigger for our shader graph. And I will minimize these things and turn off our gizmos so that we've got a nice clear view of what we're doing. All right, and I'm also gonna hit uh, Control B and drag a box around the egg so that we're just, so you won't be able to see it with that turned off. So we're just rendering what's inside there. Just switch to rendered view and just have a look. Great, all right, cool. So what we've got here is our egg. Um, now there's some things already on this. I might just, I'm gonna delete this egg material and create a new one just to, I'm not sure if we tweaked it at all, so I'll just start fresh. Egg material, there it is. Okay, so with our fresh egg material, we're gonna create something that uh, that has sort of a pockmarked um, reflected surface. So some parts, the surface are reflective and others aren't. Some are a bit more metallic than others. A bit of variation, just using another noise uh, modifier like we were previously. So roughness is the most important value for understanding reflection. And the way it works is if you've got a surface that's perfectly smooth, so let's say we've got this flat little surface here, light comes in and it's going to bounce right back off of it, okay? So all the light is gonna bounce in a really consistent way. So it acts like a mirror, right? So you look at it, all the light comes right back at you, you get to see a reflection, okay? However, if your surface has a lot of bumps on it. So it's a real rough surface like this. Our light's gonna come in and it'll hit this one. It might go boom off there. This light beam is gonna come in. It's gonna hit this one and it might go off like this. And we'll have one come in here and it's gonna, oh, it's gonna bounce off this way. So you end up with light rays going all over the place. Now the effect of that is when you're looking at this object, you're not getting all the light that's you know bouncing directly on it, coming right back at you. It's going everywhere, it scatters. And so what that does is it removes reflection. So this is how reflections work in the real world. And it's how they work in Blender as well. So at the moment, we have a roughness of 0.5. So it's right in the middle. So that means that light is, some of the light's bouncing right back at us and some of the light isn't. So we're getting a little bit of reflection and uh, we're also getting a little bit of scatter. Now, the effect that this has, let me get rid of our little grease pencil. The effect that this has is basically um, the if you've got if you've got pure, so let's go all the way down to zero. So zero roughness. There's no roughness at all. Okay. Now you can see this little oval shape. This is a, the reflection of one of our lamps in the scene. And here's the other one here. Um, I can also, if I take my color and take it all the way down to black, now you'll be able to see. Okay, we've got a perfect mirror. Now in real life you're never gonna get zero roughness. There's always gonna be some roughness, even in a mirror. So if you wanna have realistic materials, it's important that you never use complete zero values or complete, you know, go all the way to one either. Both of those scenarios aren't realistic. You need to, you know, take it right up to like, you know, uh, you know 0.98 if you wanted to go up towards one, but don't go all the way to one. It just helps with the believability of your materials. So, okay, so we've got zero roughness right now. All the light that's coming at our little circle is bouncing right back at us, and so we're getting a perfect mirrored reflection. Now, 
if I bring the roughness up a little bit, so we don't fully scatter the light everywhere, we just scatter it a little bit, right? And what you'll notice is first you get a bit of a halo effect around your light sources. But also, I don't know if you can see it yet, we'll go up a little bit higher. All right, so now you can see it's starting to blur the image. Now a blurred image is, it's a reflection, but the, the light rays aren't coming back perfectly um, to your eyes. So they're, they're, they're scattering a little bit because we've got a little bit of roughness and so it begins to blur that reflection. So this is great for materials that are metallic, um, you know, things like car paint, something that's not like perfectly reflected, but a little bit. Um, and this is a really, really nice effect. And you keep going a little bit further and eventually, you see it just continues to blur and our light source continues to spread across the object until we get all the way up to almost a five. And now you can see it's really spread out the light sources and we now no longer can see the environment. The environment is still reflecting off of this object. In fact, all the light rays are reflecting off everything in our scene. That's how global illumination lighting works. It's light that bounces around. You get these indirect lighting um, areas where the light is kind of filling in the dark areas because it's bouncing around the scene. So if we go all the way up, right up towards like 0.9, you can see it's now diffused the light. So that word diffuse, it's just when you spread the light out. So it's, it's spread that the reflectant light all the way across. It's so rough now that even the spotlight shape is lost. It's just hitting this thing and every light ray is bouncing off in a completely different direction. So that's how it works. So different materials in the real world have these kinds of behaviors. So it's important to think about what you're creating and uh, imitate it appropriately, you know, thinking about reflection. So everything's got some level of reflection. If you just look around your room right now, you're going to see objects that some of them reflect light in one way and some reflect another. So that's how roughness works, and that's how you can think about it. Now, another thing that can happen, so we'll bring it all the way back down here. If we go to our normal, um, this is where, of course, we do the, um, the the bump map thing. I don't know if I explained that well enough earlier. I'll just, let me quickly, um, I'll just give you a quick explanation of normals. So, you know, if you've got, uh, let's say we've got some geometry. Um, you can tell I love the grease pencil now. This is the first tutorial where I'm really using it. Uh, it's a lot of fun. I don't know why I didn't use it before. Anyways, uh, so we've got our, say this is, these are polygons, right? So the geometry of our object. Uh, the normal is, uh, wh where's this, this uh, face um, facing? So I can draw these lines here. I can illustrate, they're all facing the same direction, right? So these are the normals. Uh, the normal pass is you can bring in, uh, this is where you can get a bump map. This is basically bringing in different values that sell the computer to, okay, this is where the normals are really facing, but actually um, we want you to pretend like there's a lot more geometry and create all these new normals that face on all these different directions. And that's how we get a bumpy texture. So light is bouncing off in different directions. Or you can have like a texture that has a bump on it that might be denser than what your actual mesh is on the object. Um, so if we go into the actual mesh of our sphere, you can see all the different um, sorry, let me switch out a grease pencil, delete that. Um, I'm hitting the N key, by the way. That's how you, that's the hot key to bring, bring up the side thing. Uh, so all these different things are, all these different, uh, you know, squares are faces in our geometry. If we uh, go to, um, where is it hiding? Let's go into edit mode and switch to selecting faces. There it is. Um, now I can select different faces, um, turn off transparency. There you go. All right, so we've got all of our faces, but if I turn on normals, you can turn on them in the drop down menu here for um, this little icon. I come down right down here at the bottom, and we click that button there and change the size of them. This is just showing us the normals. The normals are already there, but this is just showing us. So this is the direction every single one of these faces is facing. Um, and uh, the effect of it is go to solid mode you get this, this nice even distribution of the light. Basically it's telling the renderer how to handle the surface of this object. Now, if I took like these four, right? And I, uh, I went to uh, face and, uh, sorry, mesh, normals and flip. It's gonna flip those normals. You can see it gets, gets ugly. Like, you know, look at that, that's horrible. But basically what we've told it is, uh, okay, all these faces are, you know, facing facing out and then, oh no, these are actually facing in. So if we go inside the object, you can see these four now are facing 
the other direction. So sometimes if you're modeling something, um, you know, you're creating it from scratch, you can end up with some weird effects like this, some like artifacts in the geometry where it looks really bad. One of the tricks is if you hit the A key, select all, and you go up to mesh, normal, and recalculate outside, it'll look at them all and it'll correct, correct any normals that are, that are incorrect, like the ones that we had there. So, okay, there's a good explanation of normals. I wanted to get that in there somewhere because it's important for understanding this, what this is. Um, and let's uh, yeah, turn that off. Cool. So back to our roughness um, explanation. So we've got our perfect mirror. If I was to go over here and create a noise texture and a bump texture, here we go, and take the factor of my noise, pop it into the height, and then right here, the output of bump is normal. So it creates a normal map out of it. I could probably even show you if we switch to base color. Yeah, okay. So this is showing you the color version of what this is creating. And the way normals work are different colors represent different uh, directions. So green is one direction, yellow is another direction. So this is this bit is saying, well, okay, we want the light to behave as if this face is facing this way a little bit and the green it's, it's facing this way. So it's going to tell the light how to bounce off of this object. Okay, so let's plug that into our normal. Now you can see right away how that affects things. So, you know, the green and the yellow, think about it that way. The light's coming at it. Normally it would hit and bounce right back at us, but then it's using this to go, oh, okay, now I need to take into account that there's all these extra sort of angles that uh, should make up the surface of this object. So now light's bouncing and boom, it's going off the other way. Now you can see that what it does is it breaks up the reflection, but things are still really reflectant. Like you've got, you know, a lot of reflection happening across the surface. It looks like water now. In fact, that's how you would create a bit of a water effect. But if I start increasing the size or shrinking the size, sorry, of the noise, we get further and further down. You can see it gets denser and denser and it's starting to spread out. The light bounces a bit more. But if I take this all the way up, let's go to 500, make it huge, okay? Now it's really scattering our light. And this is a very similar effect to the roughness. Now, of course, these bumps are large enough. Uh, they're much larger than sort of what it's taking into account when we're dealing with roughness, but it's the same basic concepts. You can see it's no longer reflecting because we're telling the light to go all over the place. Just unplug that there. So that's a basic explanation of how reflections work in shaders in 3D software. And this isn't just Blender. This is any kind of 3D software you're using. This is the concept. Roughness is your, your key value. All right. Now, for us to begin building this particular egg object, I want to get a nice kind of bumpy texture or a nice um, kind of broken up texture. So we're going to use um, we're going to use the Veroni shader on this one, I think. Um, so let's go ahead and grab that we'll search. I'll, I'll just grab it from the menu so you know where to find it. So it's in texture. And we have all the different types of random noise generators, and we're going to go with the Veroni texture this time. All right. So just to show you what it looks like, um, pop it into base color. Um, there you go. Well, actually, I'll pop it into emission so you can really see it clearly. All right, so that's what it's looking like. So let's, uh, what we'll do is we'll change the scale a bit. We'll, we'll increase the scale. Uh, take it right up, maybe to like 50. Yeah, it looks good. And let's see what these other options look. We've got intensity, which it's set to now. Let's try cells. Okay, that's going to create a hard edged blocky pattern, which is exactly what I'm thinking we want, because I want to have kind of like, I don't know, like a metal texture where each of these flecks is like a little bit different in terms of its reflection and the way it behaves. All right, let's see, check out the different options here. Manhattan, Chibi Chibi Chib, Minkowski, I love these names. Um, stick with Manhattan, it's pretty similar to distance. It's hardly visible, actually, any difference. We'll go with that. And let's see what these, let's have a look at second closes. That might be cool. Okay, let's, I don't want to go too, too much. Let's stick with this one and we'll see how this looks. We might, we might just go with closest once we get it in. All right. All right. And we're going to plug this in uh, to a color ramp, just like we've done with every other material, because we want to be able to control things further. So we go converter, color ramp. You can just drop it right on and it'll automatically insert it in the chain. 
Let me grab these guys and slide them out to touch. Okay. Now, I don't know if we want to play with it just yet. Again, you know, just to, just to reiterate, the reason why I use color ramps is so that I can just do this. This is really all that I'm looking to do. It's like get rid of bits and isolate other bits. Um, it's just a way of kind of being a bit more selective with what you're using. But I'm going to use all of it at the moment because I like this pattern. Um, and it doesn't matter, again, if you use color or factor. Because if you remember from previous tutorials, factor is basically just the black and white version of the, the noise. Because all the noise generators generate random color as well as shape. So if you just want the black and white, you can work with the color. But in this case, it doesn't matter because we're um, piping it into this color ramp and then it's converting it into just these two colors. So remember, color ramp always takes just the black and white values, the brightness and the darkness values of whatever you pipe into it, and then it uses those across the two colors that you have selected. Okay. Now, what we want to do is we're going to drive this uh, we're going to use this to drive a couple of things. So let's we'll start with the we'll start with the roughness. Okay. Um, so let's pipe the uh, color into our roughness. All right. So now you can see right away we're getting a nice variation. So the darker areas of our Veroni texture are being given a zero value because we've got full black. So wherever that is, it's a zero roughness, which if you remember from before is full reflection. So this, these dark areas are reflecting sort of the dark sky and the area around us. So if I was to bring this part over, so we're getting rid of all the areas where it's a one value, you can see now it's all this, most of it is this zero value. So most of it is zero roughness, which means most of it reflects. Hope that's making sense. I'm trying to kind of reiterate these ideas so that you get these concepts. Um, yeah, that's pretty cool. It's, I do want to get some reflection though out of it, so I might I'll just bring it over a little bit. All right, the next thing I want to do is mess with the metallic uh, bit of the texture. Now, metallic, what that does is basically um, it makes an object well, it's more more metal, uh, you know, less other things. So uh, it's kind of hard to see in black. So let me I'll switch to a color value. In fact, I'll unplug roughness again just so you can. See it? Put this back to 0.5. So at zero metallic, you're getting pretty much just the color, right? So we've got this, it's shiny a little bit where the lights are hitting it because we've got some specular. Okay, specular is the, the glint on an object. So how, how specky it is, how glinty it is. Um, if we was to turn this down to zero, we're not going to get any white glints at all. And it's now very much like a kind of a rough plastic material. Uh, so put that back up. And if I start increasing the metallic, value, go up to 0.6. Uh, it's a visual difference. It's a little hard to describe, but um, basically it retains it retains the color and it it the way it reflects, look, I can't actually explain this. Uh, I'm just going to tell you that if you want things to look like they're made of metal, you turn this one up. Okay, so you can see the difference. That's what it looks like at one and that's what it looks like at zero. I do cheat and I use this sometimes for objects that aren't made of metal. So sometimes if I'm creating material and I want it to retain its color, so it's losing its color through the different things that are going on in the scene, the color of the lights, the brightness, whatever is happening, you can use this as well sometimes just to bring a little bit more of whatever your base color is back into things. Because the one of the things it does, like if I turn my specular all the way up um, and turn metallic all the way off, you can see that the, the specular it's kind of really blowing it out to white. Um, you know, if I bring, uh, it's, it's easier to see with roughness that's higher. So it's it's spreading the light out across the object. So you can see it's really brightened it up. So if you compare that to this color, it's like a dark, rich pink. This is quite a light white pink. So in this kind of a scenario, I was like, oh, I want a bit more of that normal color into it. I, I can bring up the metallic. And what that's gonna do, it's gonna start coloring uh, the specular highlight. So it won't go to white. It'll start going a little bit to pink. If I go all the way up with the metallic, you can see now the specular highlight is fully pink. So it's just brightening up the object. So that's how metal behaves when it comes to specular uh, reflection. Um, I won't go into any, any further with that, but that's the gist. So let's create a bit, of, let's use a bit of um, the metallic uh, property in our object. I'm gonna put this 
back. Let's go to white. Um, we'll go back to black actually. And we'll bring this back into our roughness like we had before. And I'm going to duplicate my color ramp, I think. That's kind of cool. I don't know. We might want to keep it like that. Feel free to leave yours at any point too. If you're thinking this looks great, stick with it. I, I like that a lot. It looks really nice, really mysterious. Um, I'll just see what the metallic looks like. So this is a full metal. If I bring it down to zero. Okay, yeah, so it's really bringing in a lot more of the reflection. Um, again, so okay, it's the same idea I just described to you. It's using the color, the base color. It's, it's actually using it more. So when we're looking directly at the object, we're actually just seeing this uh, color bouncing back at us, which means it's, it's absorbing the light. It's not reflecting it. Uh, whereas at the edges, it's got this Fresnel effect, which is where you know, the light, uh, things become more reflectant um, towards the edges as they curve away from your point of view. And that's what's happening here. This, this is really cool. I actually might stick with this. Uh, let's just, let's pipe this into the metallic to see what happens if we, yeah, that's not as, that's not very special. I might duplicate this, drag it up and let's take the factor, plug it in and let's spread this one fully out and see what that looks like. All right, cool. All right, I think I decided on how I'll go with it. So I've used my color ramp to set my metallic. So we get these uh, different bits that are more metallic than others. And with the color ramp going into our roughness, what I did was I brought it up a little bit and then I increased this one up to a gray, a value of 0.3 on the vibrancy for the hue saturation and vibrancy. Or uh, you could also look at it as a 0 0.073 for RGNB. So what that does is that means that we never go fully black, which means we're never fully reflecting. Um, and there's a little bit of blur to the reflection. And I thought that looked nice. In fact, I might uh, drop this one down as well. So go to my white select the color and I'm going to drop the vibrancy down to 0.9 just so again like I said earlier it's a bit more realistic um, that looks pretty cool um, this one is feeling a little bit harsh um, a bit, bit computerized what I might do is just duplicate this and just have a look at what intensity because if you remember intensity is a much more it's much more smooth so um, if you look at the factor for intensity see it's it's not as harsh as um, as cells. Cells has a stronger cutoff. Intensity is more of a gradual look. So let's let's put that into the factor of our metallic one. Um, well, that's kind of interesting. Manhattan looks like it's giving me kind of a cube effect. Let's compare that to what we had. Now I might keep it like this. I think that looks pretty good. Okay. Uh, the last thing I want to do is just I can see a little bit of the geometry around the edges. So I just want to make sure I've got a subdivision surface. I'm going to pop it up to two. So I've got um, double that. Now, what we could do as well is, is you know, put in a bump map um, down here. But I like the fact that we've got this like smooth look to it um, with this broken kind of checkered pattern. So I'm going to stick with that. And I hope this was a helpful explanation of reflections. Uh, normals and how all this stuff is behaving again how does light behave when it hits objects and shaders in blender so i hope you enjoyed this tutorial hope it was helpful please uh you know let me know any questions you've got in the comments let me know if you're enjoying these videos in the comments uh, just pop one in for me i read all of them as they come through really appreciate uh, getting some feedback from you guys it's just really helpful and uh, please like and subscribe that goes a long way to helping other people discover the channel and discover these videos and um Gives me a, a very encouraging boost through the week when I see it happen. Uh, it makes me want to just keep, keep banking these. So I am pumped about uh, how many people are watching so far. So thanks so much to everyone who's been tuning into these and uh, finding them helpful. All right, I will catch you next time. We're going to be finishing off our scene uh, in Blender, I think. And we're going to be moving into the renders uh, render section, figuring out how to get the right render passes out so that we can get this thing composited and done. All right, thanks again for joining me and I will catch you next time.